Yes, sir. I guess I just wanted to uh, educate you also today. Um, I'm uh, going to be the fifth generation farmer on our home farm. And uh, it's my brother and my father and I. And we decided that we want, we've always had livestock. We decided we want to uh, increase our livestock operation to survive. Um, so we started out looking at just increasing by a couple hundred head of swine, hogs. And when it was all said and done, by the time we got done pushing the numbers and getting cash flows together, it didn't run in the black until we got to a, a head count of over 4,000 head. Um, being a strong agricultural family we are, we decided we were going to take that risk, borrowed nearly a million dollars to build the facilities. We feel it's part of our responsibility to, feel, to uh, feed the world, and so my dad's home today planting corn. Uh, couldn't make it today. But it really concerns me when I see writing and um, uh, things about CAFOs, because we are considered a CAFO now. Uh, we're still family farm, just the family running it. The regulations that are there today are adequate. The issue is they're not being enforced. So I would encourage you, don't make more regulations. Let's enforce the rules we've got. Because nothing makes me more upset than when I know I'm spending money for consultants and spending a lot of time filling out paperwork that's never going to be looked at. Um, so I really encourage, let's not go overboard with regulation, let's do what we got. The second point I would make is, don't put CAFOs up in a category all by themselves. Because that really, we are doing the things that are right. We're managing our manure, we're putting it where it needs to be. It's my neighbor down the road who has a few head of livestock who doesn't pay any attention to any of those rules and is polluting things and along those lines. So try and even that playing field, if you would. Well, the, uh, well look, it's, it's uh, I mean, obviously, you know, whenever you're putting together policy, you're generalizing. Uh, and, you know, we haven't gotten into all the specific details of all, you know, what kinds of approaches we'd have to take. Um, you know, when it comes to CAFOs, it's a mixed bag. I mean, some of them are very efficient operations that are dealing with uh, waste properly. You, you don't have runoff that's uh, going into the water systems. People are managing it the way you want it to be managed. There's some, small and large, that are irresponsible and cause a lot of damage to uh, the surrounding communities. And so my point is that we should just have some clear uh, standards and approaches and then give farmers the tools they need to do the right thing because sometimes the economics of it don't work real well but for you know, equip funding is a good example where you know this is funding to to help farmers deal with conservation measures and if it's going to people who are profitable enough that they can afford to do it without the extra funding we should save some of that funding to give to farmers who are trying to do the right thing, but they may still be just, you know, their margins may just not be great enough at this point to do everything that needs to be done for conservation purposes. Um, but but here's, here's my commitment. I'm not going to do anything that uh, has not been worked through by the people who actually know the land best. Now, and, and part of my job as president is also to be an honest broker uh, within these communities because there are always going to be some conflicting interests. There may be some people who, you know, they just, well, I don't mind CAFOs, I just don't want them next to me. But I do want cheap uh, pork chops. Uh, and then there are others who say, well, look, you know, like yourself, who say, if you want those cheap pork chops, the economy is a scale or the, th these are what, what I need. Uh, and my job is to bring those groups together and to listen. Uh, and we will be formulating all these agendas in concert with and in conjunction with people who are actually working on the land. I'm not going to be doing stuff in Washington just coming up with uh, a bunch of uh, bureaucratic red tape without having consulted with the people who are going to be affected by it. Okay. Thank you very much. This is a good point. Here you go. In line with the thinking globally from earlier, I know that um, everyone knows about the food riots that have been going on around the world. 
And a lot of that is due to crop dumping because of the subsidies that we give to the farms that will just dump crops on lesser countries and don't let the farmers from there grow their own. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you would do about encouraging fair trade that helps the third world countries as opposed to free trade. Well, look, it's a, it's a great question. And th there are no simple answers to this. But, but let me just try to describe what's, what I see happening. We have genuine... Uh, we have a genuine food crisis around the world that could end up getting worse. Uh, and there are a bunch of different components to it. One is uh, climate change. I already mentioned the drought in, in Australia has an impact. There are weather pattern changes in other areas that are making, uh, that are creating food shortages. Uh, a second problem is that in the rush to go into some alternative fuels, and look, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of ethanol and have been and have been a, one of the people who promoted the renewable fuel standard. Uh, what is also true is, is that we've had uh, more uh, corn diverted and that's having an impact. What's also true is China and India, they're getting wealthier and now they want to start eating more meat in their diet. And if they're eating more meat, they're using more feet. Uh, and that then is having an, an effect on basic staples. Uh, and then, as you pointed out, there's the issue of trade. Uh, big agribusiness has done a good job in creating very efficient uh, distribution systems. And you know, we have extraordinarily efficient farmers here in the United States. But what happens is, for example, NAFTA, one of the unspoken effects of NAFTA was it blew away the Mexican agricultural sector. They just couldn't compete. The minute they opened things up, our stuff started going down there, and Mexican farmers were displaced uh, in, in, you know, across the board, subsistence farmers. That's part of the reason why we've had such a bad problem with immigration, illegal immigration, is these are folks who were displaced from the land. They go to Mexico City. They can't find a job there. They just keep on heading north uh, until they get here. And ironically, they end up settling in places like the Midwest, working in meatpacking plants. Uh, but there's a connection there. So, so here's what I think we've got to do in terms of food. Uh, you know, one of the things I want to do is convene a, um, a, a summit meeting with other world leaders around food security. I think it is very important for us to work with poor countries to figure out how they can get sustainable food supplies and work with local farmers there, which doesn't mean that we're not exporting food. Look, if we're efficient food producers, we should want to open up markets and, and lower tariffs. But we have to be mindful of the fact that they also need to be able to support themselves in the case of food disruptions. And I think that we've got to figure out how to balance those things between wealthy and poor countries. We've also got to allow them to do some exporting into our country, uh, particularly around certain specialties, uh, agricultural specialties that really are not going to have a, a terrible impact on us. Um, you know, uh, my father's country, Kenya, has started shipping flowers because they've got a nice climate for flowers. Now, you know, uh, we don't have a lot of flower exporters here in Indiana or Illinois. Uh, and so allowing some, you know, foreign flower producers to get a little bit of money to help those countries, that's not going to hurt our local farm economy, but it will help theirs. So we've got to, you know, balance uh, some of that stuff. And then the final thing is when it comes to uh, alternative energy, and I'd be interested in, in people's opinions about uh, what's going on in terms of the ethanol market here because as I said I've been a huge supporter of it uh, because I really believe we've got to invest in alternative energy I do think that we're gonna have to look at how do we take corn based ethanol and how do we start transitioning or supplementing corn based ethanol with other sources of alternative fuel whether it's prairie grass or wood chips or animal waste or whatever it is you know, we should be the experts here in the Midwest in places like Indiana in developing these more efficient ways that don't necessarily affect 
feed prices. So the gentleman I just talked to here, I mean, part of what you must be dealing with is the fact that feed is a lot more expensive. And that's good for folks who are growing corn, but not so good for livestock producers. And we're going to have to figure out, are, are there ways that we can, you know, use this stuff there, you know? Make, make some gas out of this, um, right? Uh, you know, and, and that requires some investment in technology. That's one of the obligations that the federal government has. All right, great question.